may be seated. Good morning. For those of you who are new and don't know me, my name is Greg Johnston. I'm a chaplain with uh, International Fellowship of Chaplains, uh, Corporate Chaplains of America. I'm elder here at Grace Community Church. And just this morning, Bernice came up and said, are you our priest today? So that was a uh, promotion I wasn't expecting. <laughs> so, in nomine Patri, Fili, Spiritu Sancti. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So, it's really good to be filling in for Pastor Brandon over the uh, next three weeks. Yes, you get me for three weeks, and, uh, you know, there's always online. Uh, (laughs) Hey, everybody online, good to see you. So for the next three weeks, I'm going to be talking about three different people in the Bible who were very unexpectedly called to evangelize, to talk about their encounter with Jesus and how it transformed their lives. And I'll be honest with you, when I was putting together this sermon series, it made me feel very uncomfortable. So if you walk away this morning feeling uncomfortable, I've done my job. Okay, because sometimes we need to hear a message that gets us stirring a little bit. And this series is going to be one of those. So when Carrie and I lived up north in Massachusetts, we were members of a... Everybody silence your cell phones, please. (laughs) That was funny. Um, When we lived up in Massachusetts, Carrie and I uh, were part of the Christian Motorcyclist Association, and uh, we were part of the local chapter in Danvers, Massachusetts, and the chaplain of that particular group was a fellow by the name of Dick May, and uh, if we could get his picture up there, I I think we got that. There he is, Dick May. So Dick was an amazing guy. He uh, lived a very vile and debaucherous life before having an incredible encounter with Jesus. And after that, he was stricken with stage five, I think it was liver cancer, which, the God, which God miraculously healed him from and told him specifically, you are to go into the world and make disciples. And so Dick did. He took that seriously. Everywhere he went, he talked to people about Jesus. He would go on long motorcycle rides and stopping at rest stops at gas stations. He never failed to pick up a conversation with somebody to talk to them about Jesus. This picture is taken from a ride we did uh, called Nelson's Ride up north. And uh, the, uh, it was a secular ride, but they asked him to give up a, qu- a quick prayer before uh, the ride. So he got up there, and 25 minutes later, after he had presented the gospel and gave, given his testimony, he offered a quick prayer. Uh, Dick was an amazing guy, and just a few years ago, uh, the Lord called him home, said his, his business was finished here on earth of liver cancer. So it was time for him to go home. Dick is an inspiration to me, and he's one of those people who, if you knew him before he came to Jesus you would never guess that he would be called to be an evangelist. So the question is, how did Dick and the three people we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, how did they become evangelists? Well, really, it's two steps. First, they had an encounter with Jesus that transformed their lives. And second, they went out and told people about it. Pretty easy when you think about it. We make it a lot more complicated, but that's it. But before I get into the passage that we're going to talk about today, I want to review two other passages. And these are going to be the theme passages for this series. The first one should be very familiar to you, but like familiar passages, sometimes we say, oh yeah, I know that one, skim right over it and go past it. I want us to park on it for a little bit. And that's Matthew 28. 18 through 20. So please turn in your Bibles, whether they be analog or digital, and uh, go to Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And it said, Jesus came near 
Okay, this is the resurrected, crucified, resurrected Jesus. He's about ready to ascend into heaven and will soon send the Holy Spirit to empower the disciples. He came near them and he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, always to the end of the age. So the, we've talked about that the context is he's crucified, resurrected, he's about ready to ascend and send the Holy Spirit. And he says to them, all authority has been given to me. We're going to get into authority and with, the, with the next passage we get into, but keep that in mind. Keep that in the back of your mind. Remember that the authority that Jesus has is the authority we have through him. We put our faith, hope, trust into Jesus. We receive his Holy Spirit, and we're activated in his authority through his name. Not in our power, but in his. I want you to hear that. Because sometimes we say to ourselves, I, don't, I can't do that. That's not something I can do. All authority that Jesus had, he gives to us. Teenagers, you guys who are younger, when you got saved, when you became a follower of Jesus, did you get a junior league, minor league Holy Spirit, or did you get the Holy Spirit? Those seasoned citizens among us, who have wisdom hairs. I got wisdom hairs right here. Do you have a senior Holy Spirit that's taking it easy? Or do you got the full Holy Spirit living in you? You got the full Holy Spirit living in you. All authority is given to you. Second, Jesus said, go and make disciples. All right? He said, go. Did he say, let's stay put and be comfortable in our church on Sundays? No. He said, go. He was telling the disciples to go. It took the disciples about 20 years before they actually left Jerusalem and went out and started telling people. But he said, go. He didn't say, go and make converts. He said, go make disciples. See, conversion is important. It's the beginning. But it's an event. It's the beginning. He said, go and make disciples, which are lifelong followers of Jesus. Go. Don't sit still. Make disciples. Let's also look what Jesus didn't say. He didn't say, go if you have the gift of evangelism. Right? Some people do have the gift of evangelism. Billy Graham had the gift of evangelism. Reinhard Bonnke, if you've heard of him, amazing guy, led millions of people to faith in Africa. Greg Laurie, those guys have the gift of evangelism. My buddy Dick May, he had the gift of evangelism. But that doesn't mean that we're, okay, we get to take a back seat and let those guys do it. He called everybody to talk about Jesus, to deliver the life-changing message of Jesus and his resurrection to the people that he brings into our lives. Jesus also didn't say, go if you have a talent for speaking to lots of people. Okay? You don't need to be an eloquent speaker. John Wesley was an amazing writer, but the, the people have said that he really wasn't that great oratory person that George Whitfield was, but yet when he spoke, it was the power of the Holy Spirit that poured out of him. It wasn't his own power. Jesus didn't say, go if you've led an exemplary, sin-free life. If you have, uh, yeah, we got to talk. Jesus didn't say, go if you feel led. If you don't feel led, well, you can sit back. No. Go. Go if you have a Bible degree and can quote scripture backwards and forwards. He didn't say that either. He wants you to go as you. And last, he didn't say, go if the mood seems right. 
He said, go. He told all of his followers to go and make disciples. Bringing the gospel and the good news about Jesus is a mandate for every believer. So in your Bibles, I want you to underline and highlight that verse and right next to it, this is my mandate. If you've got the Bible app, make a note on there. This is my mandate. Now the next passage. This comes from Luke 9. And it's verses 1 and 2. So if we can have that up there. Summoning the twelve. He gave them power and authority. There's that power and authority. He gave them power and authority over all the demons to heal diseases and to heal diseases. Then he sent them. He sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Again, this is probably a familiar verse. I always sort of skipped over it and said, well, isn't that a nice thing he gave to the disciples? But you know what? Jesus was a model for how we are to do ministry. He would teach and then he would do. He would demonstrate. So it's no coincidence that after the best sermon, the greatest sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, that after that, he healed a leper and healed uh, the official uh, servant. Jesus is our model. He gave this mandate to the 12. He gave it to the 72. He gives it to us. We are sent to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Jesus modeled this throughout the Gospels by teaching and demonstrating. And I want you all to underline that passage, highlight it, make a note next to it or in your app, and say, this is my mandate. It's not optional. Jesus doesn't say, well, for some people we do this. No. This is for all of us. So this week and the next two weeks, we're going to look at three individuals who encountered Jesus and as a result had to go out, just compelled to go out and tell other people about that encounter. One was delivered from demons. Another received a physical healing. And the woman we're going to meet today had a deep inner healing. So please... Turn with me to John chapter 4. This is going to be our passage for the day. And we're going to see how Jesus modeled for us how to engage with people and bring the good news about the kingdom to them. Now, I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm going to summarize parts of it. But I want to start with how Jesus engaged this woman. If you recall the scene, this is the, this is the woman at the well. And it's set at Jacob's well outside the city of Sychar. Now, if you're interested, you can go to Israel. You can go to that town, and Jacob's well is still there. Do not drink from that well. You will end up with a virus that stays with you for a very long time, and it's quite nasty. But that well is still there. And Jesus was there with her. And he says to her, one thing. What was the question that he, answer, that he asked her? Give me a drink. Very simple. I'm thirsty. Give me a drink. By asking this one question, Jesus busted wide open all the religious and cultural rules surrounding Samaritans and Jews, men and women. First of all, he was a man talking to a woman. And in those ancient times in the East, men didn't talk to women in public. And in current times, in many places in the East, men still don't talk to women in public. The well was a public place. This is where people hung out. This is where all the town gossip happened. And here's a man, Jesus, talking to a woman. Do you think he cared? Nope. He doesn't give a whit for social conventions. He cares about this woman. And he asks, give me water. Second, he was a Jew talking to a Samaritan. Now let's clarify this a little bit. In our Bibles, 
in many places, especially John, we see translated, the Jews did this and the Jews did that. I think a better translation is the Judeans, because the Judean form of Judaism was far different than the common, ordinary, like in Galilee and other places. The Judean form of Judaism was really strict and really observant. And the Judean Jews wouldn't be caught dead in Samaria. Why? Because the Samaritans worshipped differently than they did. They would be considered unclean if they went into Samaria, talk to a Samaritan. So you never saw Judeans going from south to north up to Galilee through Samaria. They went all the way around. But Jesus doesn't care. He's coming from Jerusalem. So he's coming from Judea. Now Galileans, on the other hand, they had no problems with the Samaritans. They, en they engaged in a lot of commerce and trade and they, they talked with the Samaritans all the time. But here's a Jew coming up from Jerusalem, sitting next to this woman and speaking to her, a Samaritan, busting open the religious conventions. He, he basically blew them up. Because why? He cares for that woman. The woman's response reflected these taboos. And if we could go to John 4, 10 through 14. He had a mission in mind, and instead of rebuking her, he gave her the gospel. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you will ask him, and he will give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket with a well, and the well is deep. So where do you think you're going to get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. And Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water I give him will never be thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give will become a well of water springing up from him for eternal life. So notice that Jesus did not start with telling her what her sins were. He didn't start by critiquing her and saying, you need to change, you need to do this, you need to do that. No, he started with the gospel. He started with, you need living water, and I'm going to give it to you if you want it. That's where he started. She had actual liquid in mind, but he had something bigger than that. Jesus had something else in mind, and it's at this point that Jesus very gently exposes a painful part of her past. Starting at verse 16. Go and call your husband, he said to her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. And he said, you have answered correctly. I don't have a husband, for you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now let's pause here and talk about Jesus, how he exposed her life to her. Women in ancient times were dependent upon men for their survival. Basic fact. It didn't matter if you were Jewish or Greek, or Roman, or Galatian. Women were under a patriarchy, and women depended upon men for their survival. In ancient Israel, you needed, if you were a woman, you needed a husband, you needed a father, you needed a brother, an uncle, some man to help you survive. When you read the book of Ruth, you see that. Naomi is figuring she's going to go back to Israel and just die because she didn't have any men to help her out. So this woman has often been characterized as someone with loose morals, shall we say. That could have been, but probably not. What's probably more uh, possible is that this woman was a victim of multiple husbands because at that time also men could divorce their wives for any reason they wanted. She puts too much garlic in the hummus. You're out of here. 
all right? We laugh at that. That's kind of funny. But it's, that's the way it was. Jesus spoke to the Pharisees about that, when they, or the Sadducees about that. And he said, you don't get what Moses was trying to do when he, when he permitted divorce. It was because you guys were sinful and you needed a way to manage that. Okay? Men could divorce wives with very little reason. Also, in those times, men tended to die quicker than women. Uh, Josephus, the ancient historian, talks about a woman who had, had, who had been widowed four times before she was 25 years of age. So could it have been that she was a woman of loose morals? Maybe. Could it have been that she was divorced by her husband multiple times? Maybe. Could she have been widowed? Maybe. All of it, you know, it's probably a combination of things. But being a woman of five husbands and living with a man who isn't her current husband was a shameful part of her past. And Jesus is exposing that. She, uh, she was obviously startled by what Jesus said. And what would you do if some guy rolled up on you and started telling you everything you did in your past and some of your shameful secrets? you do what she did, change the subject, which is what she did. She said, sir, and this is in uh, verses 16 through 24, I see that you are a prophet. Our, ancients, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you, Jesus, say that the place to worship is Jerusalem. She just changed the subject. We're going to talk about religion now. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Again, he's blowing things up for her. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. She objected that she as a woman and a Samaritan was not good enough to be part of God's salvation work. Jesus responds that the gospel is open to everyone, even a disgraced Samaritan woman. The following two verses are the kicker. Verses 25 and 26, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Did he ever tell any of the Jews that he was the Messiah before then? Nope. Did he tell people who he healed to be silent, don't talk about it? Yup. What did he tell this woman, this Samaritan woman, an outcast? I am the Messiah. Jesus cares about those who are outsiders. So let's recap. Jesus starts a conversation with someone the culture told him he should never approach. He offered her the gospel first, the good news. He didn't, leave, he didn't lead with, let me tell you the good news, you're going to hell. No, he didn't lead with that. He led with the gospel. And then he gently and lovingly exposed her hidden secrets. And when she didn't understand the metaphor of living water, she tried to change the subject, number four. Jesus brought her back to the original conversation, which was the gospel. And he revealed that he was Messiah. She was the first human on earth to hear this message, I am the Messiah. So there's a lot we can learn from this encounter. First, Jesus calls us to speak to people we are uncomfortable with. I'm very comfortable talking to, about Jesus with bikers. I love hanging out with bikers. Cool people. Um, when I did prison ministry, loved hanging out with inmates, especially inmates that have had powerful encounters with Jesus. 
I'm really uncomfortable around very successful business people. I feel somewhat less than. But Jesus calls us to talk to people and to relate with people, even though we may be uncomfortable with speaking to them. Second, we lead with the good news that God loves them and offers them hope. Let me repeat, we lead with the message. We don't lead with judgment and condemnation. Third, Jesus does expose her past, but he does so in a way that doesn't repel her. She tries to change the subject, but she doesn't walk off offended and hurt. The truth of her life has been exposed. This revelation will prove to be vitally important later. And now finally, Jesus brings it back to the gospel and who he is. Our evangelistic conversations that we have with folks need to always, always come back to Jesus. If you are with somebody who has all sorts of reasons not to believe in God, don't get into an argument with them. Dude, I'm looking at Alan over there. Alan is amazing because God has called a bunch of really tough people into his life for him to minister to. And the thing that Alan's learned is always bring it back to Jesus. Who Jesus is, what he did, and what he's going to do for you. So what was the result? Jesus not only had a new follower in this woman, but he also had his first evangelist. Chapter 4, verse 28 through 30, the woman left her water jar, went down and told the people, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? And, all the, and the people left the town and made their way to him. Jumping up to verse 39. Now many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I did. So the Samaritans came to him. They asked him to stay with them. And he stayed two days with them. Many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said since we have heard for ourselves and know that he really is the savior of the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Did you catch that? She led people to Jesus. She was so overwhelmed with the new life that had had been offered to her that she had to go and offer it to others, fellow Samaritans, to come and have an encounter with Jesus. She's an example of an unexpected evangelist. Paul Harvey's rest of the story comes in Acts 8, verses 4 through 25. Here, Philip is where? Samaria. And the people are hearing and accepting the gospel. The rest of the story has come to them. Jesus has died. Jesus has risen. Jesus has ascended. Jesus has sent the Holy Spirit. And confirmed by Peter and John, these people all received the Holy Spirit. Why? Because this woman had an encounter with Jesus. Her life was transformed. She went back and told people about it. They came, spent time with him. And when the evangelist Philip came, they were ready for the gospel. Don't underestimate your interactions with people. When you tell somebody God loves them, You don't know what that's doing. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to them, probably in a way that they've never heard before. So, your action points for this week. Yes, you get homework when Greg preaches. First of all, this may seem daunting, but I think you can do it. I believe in you guys. Memorize Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's just a couple of sentences. No big deal. 
Memorize Luke 9, 1 through 2. That's just one sentence. And it's not one of Paul's big, huge, run-on sentences either. Man, that guy could talk. Next, I want you to get a 3 by 5 card and write down what might be holding you back from the mandates of these two passages. Next to that, on that card, write down anything from your past that might be holding you back. Things that you might need healing for. And lastly, just stick this card in your Bible. Keep it handy. Pray over it. Now as we transition to communion, one of the things I like to do with communion is to first give everybody a chance to come before the Lord. If there's something in your life that you need to repent of, especially if it's unforgiveness. If you have unforgiveness in your life, either you need to forgive somebody or somebody needs to forgive you, bring it to the Lord now. If you've got a sin in your life, maybe you haven't done it for a long time, but it's still sitting there and it still bothers you. And you can't get beyond it. Bring it to the Lord now. So we're going to take a couple minutes and in the silence of your hearts, Offer these up to God. And now, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I declare you forgiven you have brought these things to Jesus he's wiped it away it's gone if you were to go to Jesus and said remember when I he'd go nope it's gone I took care of that and the night he was betrayed Jesus was having a little meal with his disciples Passover meal And he took the bread, the matzah. This isn't matzah, but we'll pretend it is, right? And he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup. This was the fourth cup of the Passover Seder, the final cup. And he had wine in the cup and he said, this is my blood which has been poured out for you. This is a sign of the new and everlasting covenant. Do this in memory of me. So if I can get my communion helpers up here. As you're coming up and you're partaking of the Lord's Supper, 